All right, good afternoon, everyone. Just get settled here. All right, good afternoon. Just a few things at the top, and then happy to jump in and take questions. Tomorrow, Secretary Austin and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General C.Q. Brown, will join President Biden to commemorate the 80th anniversary of the D-Day operation, Operation Overlord, where thousands of U.S. and allied service members bravely fought, many making the ultimate sacrifice, to defend future generations against the spread of tyranny and evil. The event tomorrow will uh, be live streamed on defense.gov where you can tune in and watch it. Switching gears, I'd like to provide an update on our cost assessment of the temporary pier or the joint logistics over the shore capability that is being used to surge humanitarian assistance into Gaza. When we first announced this humanitarian maritime corridor, we estimated that the cost was approximately $320 million. <laughs> However, lower than expected costs for contracted trucks, drivers, and commercial vessels, and the United Kingdom's contribution of a, ver uh, of a berthing vessel for our soldiers and sailors have lowered our, cost, our latest cost assessment to approximately $230 million. While assessments are ongoing, this, assess this estimate does include some of the costs associated with the repairs and rebuilding of the pier. And just as a reminder, these are estimates and initial assessments, and the costs could fluctuate depending on the length of the mission and future costs, an example of that being additional repairs. In other news, Under Secretary of Defense for Acquisition and Sustainment, Bill LaPlante, will depart this week for a trip to Japan to reinforce the importance of U.S.-Japan bilateral relationship for advancing regional peace, stability, and deterrence. While there, he will conduct the first U.S.-Japan Defense Industrial Cooperation Acquisition and Sustainment Forum alongside uh, Japan's Acquisition Technology and Logistics Agency. This important forum will promote greater U.S.-Japan defense industrial cooperation and accelerate opportunities for co-development, co-production, and co-sustainment. A full readout of Dr. LaPlante's engagements will be posted on defense.gov at the conclusion of his trip. And lastly, as many of you may have seen, Secretary Austin's Chief of Staff, Ms. Kelly Magsman, will be stepping down at the end of June. As Secretary Austin stated, Kelly has been the in instrumental in orchestrating countless strategic initiatives to defend our nation, take care of our people, and succeed through resilience and teamwork. Her leadership, counsel, and selflessness service has made our department stronger, safer, and the lives of our people better. Kelly provided a steady hand guiding the senior staff and the department, which the Secretary will remain incredibly grateful for. And with that, I'd be happy to take your questions. Tara. Thanks. Um, on the JLOTS cost reduction, does <coughs> that includes the overall operation? It wasn't just sailing everything over there. That's for the ongoing operations. It does include salaries of personnel. It's everything that has to do with the mission of JLOTS. So um, that is the uh, total. It does include some of the repair costs that were that are being done um, at the Port of Ashdod for the repairing and rebuilding. Um, those repairs are ongoing, so that's our initial assessment right now. Um, but yes, so it, it is the total cost to operate JLOTS. Okay, and then do we have an estimate of when JLOTS will be back up and running more aid going through? So um, as we previewed earlier this week, um, we're hoping that we will be able to re-anchor the pier um, into Gaza uh, later at the end of the week. Um, I don't have an exact date for you right now, but when we get closer to that um, or when we have an announcement to make, I'll of course uh, keep you updated and then separately can you confirm that the u.s provided weapons to ukraine have been that ha that the biden administration is now allowed to be used <coughs> to strike inside russia have indeed struck inside russia so i've seen the reports of that um i can't confirm that right now i'd have to refer you to the ukrainians to speak to their operations and any any uh weapons used um in in the i think you're referring to in the Kharkiv region um i just don't have anything more for you on that carla Hey, thanks. Um, just some clarification. I think that John Kirby had said that there was confusion on the Ukrainians shooting into Russian territory. And he said that even aircraft are not, if they're not necessarily in Ukrainian airspace, that the Ukrainians had always been able to shoot at those mm -hmm. aircraft. So just to get some clarification on that, 
Has it always been acceptable for Ukrainians to fire into Russian airspace? Was it strictly Russian territory that they were told not to fire into? Give us some clarification on that. Uh, the policy change that you're referring to and that was announced last week was more about mm -hmm. um, the crossfire uh, within the Kharkiv region. Um, when it comes to air defenses, and the secretary spoke about this, air defense is something that we continue to um, that we know is a priority for the Ukrainians. Um, look, I'm not going to go into every specific incident um, of when the Ukrainians, you know, have engaged, whether it be Russian aircraft or or um, other capabilities. What I can tell you is that we know that is a threat that they continue to face, um, and that's something that we continue to work with the Ukrainians to make sure that they have the capabilities that they need to defend themselves. Okay, and I just want to follow up to us. I just want to make sure I understand this because John Kirby said there's never been a restriction on the Ukrainians shooting down hostile aircraft, even if those aircraft are not necessarily in Ukrainian airspace. So does that mean that Ukrainians can shoot anywhere, not just the, the region that was changed, where the policy was changed, they can shoot anywhere in Russian airspace if there is a hostile aircraft heading toward Ukraine? Yeah, Carla, I appreciate the question. I'm not going to... Uh, I have nothing to contradict what uh, Mr. Kirby said previously. Um, air defense is something that we know is a priority for the Ukrainians. That's why we've given them what we have to be able to defend themselves. Um, Russian aircraft, Russian air threats, we are well aware that is something that um, continues to threaten Ukrainian cities and towns. Um, I'm just not going to get into more specifics. What we have said and what we continue to say is that um, right now our, our policy is that we don't support uh, the use of ATACMs for long, you know, deep strikes within Russia. Um, but I just don't have more to add when it comes to anything additional when it comes to aircraft. Okay, and then one mm -hmm. more on the J-LOTs. Sure. You had told Tara that they could be ready to be anchored, you know, this week, later this week. Does that mean that the aid will start flowing potentially later this week as well, or will it take several days after the pier gets re-anchored? That's a great question. As soon as um, the temporary pier is re-anchored to the beach of in Gaza, uh, we expect aid to flow pretty immediately. Uh, we'll keep you updated on that. Tom. The aircraft, any sense when the F-16s will arrive in Ukraine? I know some of the Ukrainian pilots have been yeah. giving interviews. Uh, don't have an update yet, on, at least for from our side on on aircraft um something that you know we're working with the ukrainians on but don't have a specific date for In you ballpark weeks months i don't have a date for you yeah janie thank you sabrina two questions uh as you know uh, due to various uh provocations such as north korea's recent trash balloons the south korean government decided to completely suspended the September 19 military uh, agreement, uh, I mean inter-Korean military agreement, and the uh, manual was sent to the United States and the Japan allies. Do you agree with the South Korean government's decision on that? Yeah, so I, thanks, Janie, for the question. I don't really have anything to, to add on to that. What I can tell you is, you know, we continue and always will uh, consult with our partners in the region, like the Republic of Korea, like Japan, um, obviously have continued to monitor the recent actions of the DPRK, but I just don't have anything to add on that front. All right, thank you. Okay. Another one. Uh -huh. at, the, at the recent uh, U.S. and ROK, Defense Ministerial Meeting at the Shangri-La Security Conference. Secretary Austin said that uh, South Korea's uh, support for nuclear-powered uh, submarines is uh, different from Australia's support for nuclear-powered uh, submarines. South Korea and the US, United States are allies, so why is the support different? Um, sorry, Janie, I'm not sure that I fully captured the quote on that um, exactly. I think you're paraphrasing some of the words that the secretary used. Um, you know, we continue to work with our partners in the Indo-Pacific. Um, in terms of what the secretary said, I don't have anything additional to add, so I'm just going to let his comments stand for what they were. I'm just going to go to the phones here. Uh, Jeff Shogel, Task and Purpose. Now, thank you. And I apologize if this has already been um, uh, addressed in another briefing, but 
is is there going to be anything different when the JLOPS peer is re-anchored to make sure that it um it, it deals with the surf and the tides better so the chances of it uh breaking up again are less thank you so much yeah thanks jeff for the question so um i think it's important to remember that uh, for a, a little over a week, JLOTS was operating um, quite efficiently. We were able to get, you know, in total over a thousand metric tons into Gaza. Um, what happened was something that was quite unprecedented. It was the high sea states and then that storm that that changed direction and created um, an untenable environment for JLOTS to operate in. Um, there's no change um, to how JLOTS is going to continue to operate. Um, what we are going to do is continue to monitor weather conditions. If it if there is a time and place where the commander feels that you know there's another storm coming and out of an abundance of caution, uh, you know removes that temporary pier for whether it be hours or a day, you know I could see that you know potentially happening in the future. But obviously it's hard to predict the future when it comes to weather. Um, so right now, no, no change. Um, JLOTS is going to operate as it did before, um, and it was successful in that regard. We're going to work to continue to get humanitarian aid um, into the Palestinian people who need it most, um, and that aid should flow um, hopefully almost immediately as soon as the uh, pier is uh, re-anchored into the beach of Gaza. I'm going to take one more from the phone, and then I'll come back into the room. Uh, Idris Ali Reuters. Hey, do you have any update on the service member who was in critical condition after um, uh, the, the injury um, they suffered? And then second question, um, I think it was a couple of weeks ago now, you had talked about how the Pentagon was still assessing whether the Israeli assessment of what happened with the World Food Kitchen um, staff was, uh, was something you believe to be accurate. It's now two months. Um, do you have an assessment? And if not, are you, is the department actually making a good faith effort to find out what happened or have you uh, kind of moved on from that? I'll take the uh, last one first. So in terms of the world kitchen strike, um, you have to remember it's not just the department. It is an interagency effort. Um, so we have, uh, you know, been briefed um, on some of the findings. Uh, there were some delays to additional briefings that um, I think due to some of the events that were happening on the ground. Um, it's something that we're still assessing. I know that's not, um, I know that's that's a frustrating for you to hear, but it is something that we are still assessing. We certainly haven't forgotten about it. Um, but it's not just the department, the Department of Defense, um, receiving this assessment and analyzing it. It is an interagency effort. And as you probably know, um, uh, the National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, was also in the region um, meeting with his Israeli counterparts, receiving updates. So um, it's something that we're certainly attuned to, but I just don't have a better readout for you uh, today from the podium. Um, thank you for asking about the soldier um, who, who was injured. Um, so uh, an update on his condition. Yesterday, the soldier and his family were transported via military aircraft from Israel to San Antonio, Texas. The soldier is receiving treatment at Brook Army Medical Center and remains in critical condition. Um, of course, our thoughts and, and prayers are with him and with his family. Um, I just don't have more for you other than that that update. But thank you for the question. Come back in the room, Tony. Strike question. The New York Times did a pretty good story over the weekend about the Rafa strike that killed those 45 or so people. They identified down to the serial number that a, a joint, a, a small diameter bomb was used. Can the Pentagon confirm at this point that, yeah, unfortunately, a small diameter bomb was responsible for the damage? And have small diameter bomb uh, shipments continued? unabated during the conflict. So we've only paused that one shipment of the of the 2000 pound bombs. Um, I don't have any updates on on shipments in terms of those are through FMS sales and FMF. So I would refer you to the State Department on any additional weapon shipments to Israel. Um, in terms of your uh, question on the the reporting on the small diameter bomb. I cannot confirm that. Um, I've seen the reports, but I, I just can't confirm that. I'd refer you to the Israelis to speak to their operations. You know, as part of your uh, your, uh, your your guidance or your, your office that looks at mitigating civilian harm, mm -hmm. are they looking at the f forensics of this thing in terms of whether, in fact, the U.S. bomb was used? That would seem to be a, a task of theirs. I think we've been very clear uh, from the beginning that 
there's been too many civilians that have been killed in this war. Um, it's something that we've said privately and publicly. Um, our d departments are looking at things holistically. I don't have more for you on this particular incident. I can't confirm the reports. What I can tell you is that in every single call that the secretary has with Mr. Gallant, this comes up the use of how they're conducting their operations, the importance of upholding humanitarian law and the laws of armed conflict. I just don't have more for you on this particular incident. I need to ask you about Ms. Magnuson's exit too. You know, her sure. name came up quite a bit during the uh, January fiasco yeah. about the hospital stay. Uh, and the IG is still working on the report. A server exit at all connected with an in looming release of a Pentagon Inspector General report that may be critical of her conduct. I think the Chief of Staff to the Secretary has served uh, in this position for, I think, upwards of three and a half years, also served on transition. Um, I think she has deserved some well-deserved uh, well time off before she pursues other opportunities. I have no idea when the IG is going to release their report. Um, that is why the independent, uh, that is why the IG is independent and separate. Um, I have no idea when that's coming. So, no, I think this, uh, Kelly decided to uh, leave when she did because after three and a half years, I think she's earned some well-deserved time off. Fair enough, thanks. Yeah, Liz. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> to follow up on Andres' question on the injured service member, can you say how they were injured? Um, it was a non-combat injury that happened on a ship that was away from uh, the pier, but for more specifics, I just I don't have that for you right now. Okay, and separately, um, today the Five Eyes um, Intelligence Alliance released a bulletin warning of China's increased efforts to recruit um, Western pilots. What is the U.S. military doing to deter its own pilots, former pilots, service members from you know taking these bribes and training Chinese pilots? I think also you know loyalty to your country. I think is 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 certainly one that we always you know impart on our service members. Um, uh, it's something that we're certainly aware of. You've seen it. It's, it's a joint report. I don't really have more to add. Um, but, uh, you know, it's something that we certainly take seriously. And um, we, of course, you know, always expect that our pilots will uphold the standards that they are trained under and that um, they, uh, you know, keep their training specific to the United States. Um, and just mm -hmm. to follow up, in general, um, generally speaking, why is it concerning that Western pilots would be training mm. Chinese pilots. Can you just explain if there's any national security risks from that? I think you answered your own question with that. I think there are national security risks there. Um, I don't have more to add. I think the report goes into a few more details on, on like warnings and um, sort of our concerns, but I just, I don't, I don't have more to add to it. Oren. I just wanted to ask, yeah. follow up on Tony's question, just sure. to be clear. Um, Kelly Maximin's, was Kelly Maximin's departure her own decision? And was it in any way related to the notification failures? Complete own decision and no. Um, I'd have to remind you that uh, what you're referring to happened much earlier in this year in January. It is June. Uh, the secretary has conducted, I don't know how many trips off the top of my head this year, but uh, he just concluded his 10th trip to the Indo-Pacific. He is in France. Kelly is on that trip. Um, she has been on many trips this year. So no, um, and you saw his statement. I think there is truly some, that is truly someone that has um, demonstrated um, an incredible dedication to service to this department and of course to the secretary. Um, and so, you know, we, we certainly wish her well and she is, uh, I hope whatever she does next, I hope it's filled with a lot of sleep and hopefully catching up with friends and family. Tara, just a follow on that. Um, what is the update on the secretary's cancer treatment? Is he completely in remission? Is he still seeking treatment? I know we've seen that we've seen previous statements saying, you know, it's being handled, but what's the His status? prognosis remains excellent. Um, I, I mean, as someone that uh, has a family member that has gone through something similar, when your prognosis is excellent, you continue to be monitored by your doctors. You're not necessarily getting treatment, um, but your doctors are continuing to monitor for you in case anything, um, you know, were to come up. If it's six months, a year check-ins, whatever that is, I'm not a medical professional. I'm not going to pretend to speak on behalf of, you know, give you a, a doctor's analysis from here, but um, his cancer prognosis remains excellent. Um, 
every time that he's gone to Walter Reed Medical Center or any type of doctor's appointment, we certainly read that out um, and let you know about that. Uh, but I just don't have more to add on that. But I guess my question is, has he continued to get some <coughs> form of cancer treatment to keep things in check or did everything kind of stop after that one? You know, Not to my knowledge. Uh, his cancer prognosis, I know, I'm not trying to be a broken record here, but it is excellent. Um, doctors will obviously continue to monitor anyone's cancer prognosis whenever you're diagnosed, um, but uh, I'm not aware that he's still being treated for anything in, in relation to that. All right, okay, one more question, yeah. So, uh, Sabrina, what's your assessment of the shooting of, uh, at US Embassy in Lebanon? Probably US State Department has more to say, but do you have anything? <clears throat> So we, we're monitoring what happened on the ground there. I would refer you to the State Department to, to speak more to the incident. Um, I believe it was around the U.S. Embassy and that an investigation is being conducted. But um, I think we're very grateful and, and thankful for the, um, the, the Lebanese Armed Forces and the International Security Forces that are there. All of our U.S. personnel at the embassy are safe. Um, but I would direct you to the State Department for more information. Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone.